partner, Partnership Grants Committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you'd like to comment during the meeting, please type I have a comment or I have a question in the chat and a message will be sent to the host. Alternatively, you can also use the raise hand feature. In efforts of transparency for all those joining this public meeting, uh, we request that you refrain from having side conversations on chat about the content of the meeting. Again, the chat feature is utilized simply as a tool for you to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. Um, Going forward, all um, Trust Fund Commission meetings and committee meetings will be recorded and posted on the State Bar website. Uh, friendly reminder that this is a video conference and please be aware of your surroundings um, behind you. Just a few troubleshooting tips um, for those using Zoom on a computer, when on mute, holding down the space bar will temporarily unmute. If you use your phone to dial into this meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback issues. And while joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thank you. And can you take roll, please, Crystal? Sure. Uh, Christina Venerelli? Here. Kim Bartelson? Will Bichelli? Here. Eric Iskin? Deborah Myers? Here. Chris Schreiber? Here. Go to our advisors. Um, Judge Jaskul? Justice Murray. Um, let's see, is Bonnie Huff on the call? All right, um, State Bar staff, um, I'm here. Erica Carroll? Here. Elizabeth Hom? Here. Andrea Fatanides? Here. Great. Um, oh, and then Dan's on the call as well. All right, I don't know if the other uh, committee members noticed, but we have a new uh, committee member who is actually coming back. His name is Eric Iskin. Uh, hopefully he'll pop in on the call today, but we wanna welcome him back to the Partnership Grants Committee. Call for public comment. I understand that there's at least one member of the public out there who would like to speak at today's meeting. If so, could you please identify yourself? Hi, this is Kirsten Voiles from Legal Assistance for Seniors. Hi, um, Kirsten. I understand that you wanted to make comments concerning the 2020 budget revisions and carryover requests. Is that right? Um, yes, I understood there might have been some questions about our partnership grant. So okay. I am here and our CFO is attempting to log on in case you all have questions for us that we oh, can excellent. answer. All right. We actually have that item. Um, on our agenda, could we trouble you to just hang out at this meeting for just a few minutes until we get to that item? Sure. Okay, excellent, thank you. Thanks. Are there any other members of the public that would like to identify themselves? Stephanie uh, Hafner did raise her hand. Yeah. Who? Stephanie Hafner is- Stephanie uh, Hafner. Yeah, hi, um, Stephanie Hafner with Legal Aid of Marin. Um, also here um, because um, I'm informed that our carryover um, application is being considered. So I'm here in case there might be questions. Oh, excellent. And can you uh, wait on the call until we get to that agenda item as well? Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you. Are there any other members of the public that wish to identify themselves? There's a Lenore Merlander and a Shelby, Shelby Knock. Okay, well, they're not required to speak up, but they're certainly welcome to. Um, Shelby Knox is from CLA SoCal and um, Lenora is from LAS. So I have probably similar um, reasons as well for the budget revisions and carryover requests. Okay. I forgot, yeah. Okay. okay. Hearing no other uh, people popping up to speak, let's go to the next um, agenda item which is the item three, consent to approve the meeting summary and action items for November 13, 2020. Does anybody have any comments on those minutes? Okay. Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the meeting summary and action items? Sure, motion to approve. Okay, thanks, Will. 
Do we have a second? Okay, well, I will second in that case. All in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, um. I did it again. I did it again. Let's have a roll call vote, Crystal, please. Sure. Um, Venerelli? Yes. Bartelson? Michelle Lee? Yes. Um, Iskin? Myers? Stain, I wasn't present at the meeting. Schreiber? Yes. Great. Um, let's see. Kim, I got a, a notice from Eric Iskin that I think he's trying to join the, the call um, or he might be phoned in. Let's see. I just saw a chat note from someone indicted Ready saying, I voted. Did you hear me? No. So, um, I just promoted Ready, who, uh, <laughs> may, who may be. I think it's Eric. Ready? <laughs> Eric, are you ready? <laughs> right. Nope, no. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> can you guys hear? Okay. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I was. I did a phone bank for the Georgia Senate race, and they wanted me to change my name to Ready to move me to a room. And so I'll, I'll, I'll undo that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no better reason. <laughs> All right. So that that motion passed. Uh, yes. Okay. All right, so now we're on to uh, item four, the review and approval of the 2020 budget revisions and carryover request. And Crystal's gonna talk about that. Sure, so this is agenda item um, 4A. There was an attachment on the posted meeting agenda. Um, a, a slightly hard to read, but um, that's kind of our typical format um, with the, um, percentage of the carryover budget revision requested. Um, as a reminder on the screen, this was just the motion that was approved by both the committee and the commission uh, permitting the budget revisions under carryover request for 2020. Um, and just a summary of the requests received, all in all, we received 14 requests, um, 11 um, re um, need committee approval today. And just to note of that 11, four had the staff recommendation to approve. Um, the, they're between 25 uh, 26 to 49 percent, um, seven were um, deferred to committee, 50 percent or higher, and the remaining three were approved, um, automatically approved by staff because we do have authority to approve requests um, up to uh, 25 percent. Um, I also wanted to in include, in addition to what was posted on the meeting materials, um, there was an additional budget revision that was submitted um, after the 20th from CLA SoCal uh, regarding their um, workshop at the Norwalk Superior Court. This is their explanation um, for your reference as well, um, because it's 50% staff recommendation is, is, is to approve. So um, I know we have several uh, members of the um, public um, from these organizations on the line. I just wanted to open it up to see if um, the committee members had any questions regarding those um, larger requests um, that were um, that have been set to defer to committee status. I, I had a question. Um, so I don't really oppose any of this, but for the larger requests, the effect of that will be that their 2021 dollars will be substantially higher than um, they ordinarily would be. Are we expecting that they will, and what if they can't spend all this money in 2021? Are we going to similarly be looking with favor on carryover requests at this time next year? Um, or, you know, what are we going to do about that? And do we want to, we had a similar question in the eligibility and budget review committee when we had similar kind of carryovers, and we decided to be pretty liberal there about approving them. But we also decided that sometime early in 2021, we were going to make a decision and communicate to the public uh, our intent to handle carryovers next year. So anyway, hopefully that comment made some sense. You know, what, what are we what are we looking at 2021, basically? Um, th this issue has um, been of concern in the past, which is one of the reasons why carryovers haven't traditionally been uh, liberally uh, provided in a partnership context. But um, 
the information that we got uh, this year from surveys and from the field generally was that uh, there's an expectation that it, all of the savings this year are going to be expended next year when the tidal wave hits, when everything that didn't happen starts happening. Uh, it's going to cost more to provide services and a lot more services are going to be needed uh, than typically. So um, I think that the the idea, the approach is to provide that cushion for now and then to take a lead, take our lead from um, that meeting we uh, have in January to find out when, uh, whether there's going to be uh, a need for continued liberal flexibility or some other approach. Um, do, we do we have a meeting scheduled in early next year of this committee? Uh, not of this committee uh, yet, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking that when the, uh, the full commission talks about this, uh, that's going to kind of set a tone that uh, we, we want to at least recognize. So I'm just putting the motion again. Um, it, it just was specific to 2020. It's, it's kind of hard to foresee like if this will be carried over into the 2021 process. Um, I think what we're aware of is um, if approved, they will be approved to spend on the funds for the next 12 months. As for re-extending re this for 2021, um, I don't think we've like began that conversation yet uh, as well. And we need to coordinate with Judicial Council, um, you know, and uh, as well as what the other committees such as LGBT and Budget Review um, and their stance on this is. So so I can only speak to like what, what we've talked about and I think what, what was approved, but um, kind of uh, seeing moving forward, I, I don't, we're not quite at that point and maybe we, the committee can revisit this um, at a future meeting. So, um, yeah. Are there any other comments? Any yeah. strong feelings about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just had some questions um, on uh, the carryover Funds. I I think the census we're gonna uh, uh, vote for, yay on all of them. But where does that money go um, if if it gets returned? For example, the what you had up on screen previously, I think, was the Norwalk from Community Legal Aid SoCal um, <laughs> doing a fifty percent budget. Re reduction requests, which is, is frankly confusing. I think this was a grant that I re reviewed, and it seemed like it was an important service that could be provided online. So, uh, but first, where does that money go? Our reserves, our, our partnership grant reserves. Okay, so it's still gonna be for partnership grants. Yeah, going and it forward. will be redistributed next next cycle. Okay, um, excellent. Um, how, how usual is uh, this reduction request? So this one, um, I believe Shelby's on the line too, if she can speak more about it. Um, but this was um, CLA SoCal, this was the um, 2020 project um, in which um, this project, uh, I think had a delay with submitting their MOU. So they haven't received the funds yet and looking into um, what they could actually spend because um, I believe there is a project for 2021. This was what they estimated. So they're, they're seeking yes. a reduction. So we had them submit a budget revision um, okay. just to kind of estimate what those expenses would and, okay. and to answer your, your question, well, typically we don't get a lot of requests uh, to reduce grant awards, um, but uh, obviously this is a atypical year. So we're, we're entertaining all sorts of requests we don't normally do. Certainly. And the um, one that I flagged, I was really curious how they are doing a 99% carryover with the Central California Legal Services. Um, what happened there? Do is we, that a do we know question for, Is that a question for Shelby? Should um... oh, since, since yeah. Central California. Is, um, is oh, yeah, yeah. Mark, I don't believe. He's oh, I don't talking. see. Okay. Sorry, I was looking at the. I was looking at the screen. Sorry, yeah, I changed the, <laughs> the topic there to the Tulare County Unlawful Detainer Workshop by Central California Legal Services, and they're requesting the ninety nine percent carryover, um, and I'm just. Curious, did they have trouble getting it started uh, uh, before the pandemic uh, took off and shut down the court services? Is there any concern there? I'm, I guess I have some concern that 99% is- UDs were, UDs were essentially shut down and they kind of still are. So I think it's not unreasonable that they, to expect them to be a, them to be, there to be a flood of them 
next year. Oh, I think that's totally reasonable. It was just the January, February, March of 2020, um, why those didn't get expended at all. If there was some sort of program problem, the court not being supportive or something else, a concern there. Not sure that that was a, an ongoing project. Was that its first year, 2020? Yes, it, it was, it, I so. as I read it, it yeah. was a new project. Yeah. So, so um, it, it, it's often difficult to do the startup and, and, and to ramp up something, especially when you're moving into a county that doesn't have experience, uh, as Tulare does not, with um, you know, having a, an, an in house private self help component. So, um, I'm not surprised that this didn't take off in the first three months. And I'm certainly not surprised that it didn't do much business in the following months. Okay. I guess as long as we're monitoring it, I feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, you know, th this was actually a project that the Tulare court uh, reached out to CCLS and asked them to propose. Uh, this wasn't something that was imposed on the court. The court asked for this. So I, I, I think that this is um, not as bad a sign as it looks, I hope. <laughs> um, okay, I guess we don't have any more information on it then. Other than what was provided, no, um, but, but if, if the committee um, would like some additional information after this meeting, that's also a, a possibility if there's some supplemental information. Um, I did just wanna put for the next slide. Um, just additional, some, some additional considerations as to like how to treat this 2020 grant year. We did share this, mm -hmm. um, this list and chart with, with Bonnie earlier, um, like in terms of treating it because it was such an atypical year, should, should this be kind of like a waiver year towards that five year um, period that the committee usually looks at these grants? Um, would the committee consider any uh, maybe cap, cap percentages? Um, just a reminder that, that um, cap percentages weren't done for the eligibility and budget review committee. So I don't know if we're seeking um, parity in terms of um, how these requests are treated, but just some some other considerations um, as well. So. Okay. And um, well, Shelby from um, uh, CLA SoCal is on the line. I don't know if you wanted to ask any additional questions or if that response was sufficient um, about their, their request that was on the prior screen. Yeah, I, I think it was um, sufficient. Uh, I'm, I'm trusting that the staff has a better feel for the how these organizations are proceeding. There are so many variables here and for us to really truly understand the contingencies that they're dealing with, I, I think that's a fool's errand. So I'm, I'm going to lean in favor of trusting the agencies, though on, on big numbers, you know, I, I worry that we're holding money back uh, that could go into the pot for next year. But it's at this point, I don't think it's enough of a concern to hold up um, approving the carryover requests, at least from my perspective. I, just to follow up on that, um, again, I, I could agree with Will, but I'm just curious, are, so these are mostly clinics that are operating at the courthouse, right? Mm -hmm. yes. and, and because the courthouses have been largely shut down, a lot of these clinics have been shut down. Are, are, are these clinics, do people know, are they shifting to more of an online mode as opposed to, I mean, is that the plan for, do we know, if, like for 2021, that instead of making people come to a courthouse, are they making their um, services available on Zoom or something mm -hmm. like that? The remote services, um, yeah, that, look, that appears to be like an ongoing trend, just we actually did a survey last year, uh, just a month or so after the pandemic hit, to find out how uh, projects were adjusting, and um, checked in again after the application process uh, to see if they needed to make any budget revisions or adjustments based on their experience. Everybody seems to think that uh, what they're doing can mostly be done as remotely as anything else can be done, but they're looking forward to moving back to the courts. So it's kind of a, a running theme that uh, when we can get back to doing it in person, we will. Until then, some organizations have been very creative in developing um, virtual ways of working around this, uh, you know, conference rooms and meeting rooms and things right in the courthouse. Um, others are, are still building those those ways of, of working around it because their, their work is more um, intensely personal. Um, there's a wide range. And 
to, to follow up on that, the, the community court programs, are the courts are still meeting over video or phone? Because I think Legal, Legal Aid Marin, for example, they do a community court and it wasn't held at the courthouse, but I don't know if they're still able to have those. Um, Stephanie. Actually, Stephanie, Stephanie raise your hand. Yeah, if you'd, if you'd like me to address it, I can. I would yeah. love it. Um, yeah, the community court program is taking place um, remotely. Um, it is at a lower volume um, because the demand is lower right now um, for a variety of reasons. Um, people having uh, more immediate needs as well as some of the uh, factors that send people into the court um, are um, reduced right now because of the pandemic. Um, but yes, we are doing it remotely. I think it's it's court by court um, according to the court's priorities. Um, whether a remote court is happening at all, but our court took a two month pause and then resumed remotely. If there's a, a, any additional questions, I'm gonna just put the proposed motion on, on the screen. Um, for the committee's um, consideration. And Crystal, mm -hmm. one of the other slides said there's 14, but there's 13. Is that correct that as on the, the chart? Yeah, on the chart is 13, but the 14th was um, CLA SoCal's with that budget revision on the screen, which is um, why I, I, it was a separate slide. Okay. Yeah, I would uh, uh, first thank you, Stephanie. That's, I'm glad the courts are still moving, uh, meeting and I am glad to motion uh, for the Partnership Grants Committee recommend approval of the 2020 Partnership Grant budget revisions and carryover requests. All right. Is there a second? Second. Deborah, thank you. You're welcome. Any further discussion before we do a roll call vote? All right. Crystal, could you do that roll call vote? Sure. Vanarelli? Yes. Uh, Bartelson? Uh, Bashelli? Yes. Myers? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Um, Iskin? Yes. Great. Motion passes. Great. All right. We'll move on to the next agenda item. Uh, members of the public and anybody else on the call, you're welcome to stay and enjoy the rest of the meeting if you'd like. Um, but Crystal's going to give us an update on the rubric project that we discussed last time. Great. Thanks, Rosina. All right. So, um, very similar to what we talked about um, a few weeks ago, um, we did make revisions to the um, updates to the memo, um, which was posted under um, item 4B on the agenda. This is kind of just a bird's eye view of what that um, updated rubric entails, taking consideration what the um, committee um, offered us suggestions. We also did some additional research looking at existing rubrics with um, LSC and other, um, other state um, government funded grants um, for some parity and some similarities, um, as well as feedback from our own HP, um, HP rubric as well. So that it's slightly revised, but, but fairly similar. As you can see, eligibility requirements are still a yes, no, and then um, <clears throat> kind of a two to three part, depending how you look on it, selection criteria and funding priorities as uh, separate categories and optional per um, Justice Murray's suggestion, offering additional points for um, particularly innovative projects. Um, on the screen. So I just wanted to yeah. see if there were any any questions. We kind of fleshed it out a little bit more um, per, uh, after our initial discussion. Um, yeah. And uh, in addition, another suggestion during the meeting was to offer some suggestions because we did have a three prong of um, exceeding expectations, meet expectations, and below expectations. Um, these are very, um, these are pulled almost directly from LSC's own definitions and we, we, we reformatted them slightly as well, just to kind of give some parameters as the committee members are um, reviewing proposals and, and um, yeah, proposals for 2022. So again, a reminder, this would just be for the 2022 um, uh, partnership uh, partnership grant app, uh, administration. Um, there, we will be revisiting policies and changes like that in the codification process and, and, and possibly potentially like re, uh, <laughs> re changing or updating this rubric, but this is for, for 2022 to provide some framework and also just, just to see kind of how it goes so we can improve it for, for future grant years. If you look at Crystal's excellent memorandum dated December 1st, starting on page six, 
it shows sort of a sample worksheet and how the calculations um, would be done. I found that pretty helpful. We had some pretty robust discussion about this last meeting. So what comments does everybody have today? Justice Murray? Um, hi, Crystal. Great, great job on this. Uh, did we did we try to test drive this on any existing projects to see how it would plug in? Thank you for asking, Justice Marie. Um, <laughs> so what we're seeking today is to get approval kind of for the rubric in concept. And so um, because of the turnaround with the time from our last meeting and this meeting, like we didn't have time to, t to test drive. I like that um, phrase actually. Um, so we're, we would be seeking um, maybe two to three volunteers to, to kind of do that random, that sample um, that you, you brought up last time to, 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 to test out and to validate the scoring. So there's flexibility to change the scoring if it doesn't work, turn out um, kind of how, you know, to, we can, we can cali um, calibrate basically and change and update it. So I, yeah, I, are you looking for a commission member volunteers to do that? I mean, I would be willing to, to volunteer if you are. I mean, I, I, I'm new to this, so you guys have thought about this a lot, a lot, I'm sure. So forgive me for asking this question, but I was just trying to, to visualize like how this works. I mean, I, I can visualize like a guardianship clinic, for example, that I've participated in at the LA courthouse, LA Law Library with Bates Sedek. You know, they staff it with um, a couple of attorneys and a staff person and they meet once a week and blah, 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 blah. So if we were to get that proposal, um, along with other similar proposals, I was trying to envision how we would figure out whether it exceeds expectations or meets expectations. I mean, can somebody kind of just, is it possible just briefly to talk through how we might do that? I, I'm, I'm not, I'm having trouble visualizing how that would work. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, oh, sorry, go uh, ahead. Yeah, I think that's one reason why it's important to test drive this and, yeah. and just, in the abstract, I, I was having the same problem Eric is, and I've been at this for a while. So uh, I, I wonder if we might end up grading the quality of the application as opposed to the quality of the project, you know, especially in making determinations between exceeds and meets expectations. I, I think that you know, doesn't meet expectations. That's a clear category. But the other two seem to be a little bit more squishy to me. And, yeah. and Justice Murray, I think that's uh, why I think we want to do the test driving to, to, to um, I think it's part of the calibration. I, we did it for the um, HP uh, RFP. We, you know, all the committee members did did the we all reviewed one application and then we all got together to um, calibrate to make sure that we were you know looking at uh, you know issues like you you brought up that we're not grading the quality of the application but actually the quality of the services that are being proposed. <clears throat> so then, um, Elizabeth, I'm sorry. I just uh, every committee committee member in that instance reviewed the same application. So yeah, so for EAF HP, for um, we didn't have this process where we're kind of going to try to review old applications to calibrate. Uh, we the when we received all the new new applications, um, every committee member and every staff person, we all reviewed one application together and discussed it in each working group to calibrate to make sure that we were you know kind of highlighting the the issues and and scoring um, kind of similarly so that you know somebody who's you know a tough grader wouldn't you know impact uh, the applications that they were reviewing okay but here um, since we have a, we have a pooled sample to get a sample of we can do it that way right to yes yes i'll review a few yeah, of them and see if they come out definitely the same. and i okay. think you know even when we get the new applications in the new year um, next March, I think. Um, we can also do a similar exercise with everybody reviewing one application and uh, going through that exercise to just make sure that we really are calibrating and um, you know scoring scoring yeah, equitably. Um, and I think Chris has his hand up. So I guess the one lesson that it seemed like we learned in the HP rubric was the like the problems that can arise when you have a huge category. 
So I guess the thing that jumps out at me is like, and if I'm, am I reading it right? There's 105 possible points or sorry, 115. That's right. So, I mean, basically like things are sort of made or broken in the 80 point category. And the 80 point category has a lot of different subcategories. Yeah, so do you mind, do you, I, I don't know if that was, if you can put that onto the screen. Do you have the memo that you could just share? I do, yeah, yeah. Or so I guess. Um, Crystal, do you have the memo to yeah, share? Let me, let me pull it up. Um, sorry. And I and re really, I, one of my questions was just on that second screen of the meet succeeds below, like, is that an effort to do what we've been sort of doing informally, which is to say, like, trying to group these things into a, into priority sort of cat boxes almost, or tiers? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, is, is this what you were referring to, Chris? Yeah, so, yeah, thank you. And, and I just wanted to, um, I guess, ask on this grouping, of, for the 80 points is the one of the issues that we came across was whether we were expected to be grading things sort of on a curve or whether these were sort of objective like in other words everybody could get 80 potentially or or should sort of only the top program get 80 points for this category and then sort of work down from there so that we end up with a little bit of a bell curve. Because I, I think like one issue that we have confronted in this committee over the years, and I'm looking at like court involvement. Um, and I'd invite Justice Murray or even Bonnie or Dan or yeah, <laughs> like people who've been on our committee and we've talked about this, our subcommittee. But like, it's hard, like you get a letter from the court, it's often drafted by the program, it seems like, or it's sort of a pro forma letter and they sort of check the box, which we've, I guess, sort of forgiven in the sense because we know that the court is um, busy and, and th that's a, it's sort of a tough ask at times and some courts are just more responsive than others. So, you know, I, I guess I don't know what that would look like in the rubric if we're like, how do you exceed your, an expectation of the court's involvement versus if they've gotten the letter, how would we apply this rubric in the various kinds of scenarios? What, what sort of the thinking there? I, I mean, one one thought is, you know, if they just got the letter, that would meet expectations. But if um, it's clear in the application that, you know, the court requested these services or the court has been really involved in planning and um, promoting um, and really working together with the uh, QSP to to implement this project, then that seems to be exceeds. I mean, just kind of talking abstractly. Yeah, and then so then what's the number that attaches to those two scenarios? Um, Crystal, do you can you scroll? Okay. Yes. So I think there's a little bit of discretion for committee members to to assign a number. Um, and um, is that right, Crystal? So for um, selection, it's actually they check mark the box okay. and then multiply it by the multiplier. And is it just one check mark? Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, I also just wanted to add like at, at the at the end of this too, just because for consistency and for overall flow, like we'll have to provide, we'll provide information about this new rubric in the RFP and also take a look at the existing application just for flow. And if these questions need to be more explicit to help the committee members um, review the application and make those determinations, I think like it, it'll just it'll have to be kind of all consistent around because I think the current application doesn't necessarily support this rubric. So we'll have to make adjustments on our end, um, which which that will we'll, we'll do um, before the before the release. Yeah, I guess uh, one recommendation I guess I make is given the sort of breadth of knowledge that staff has on this, 
it would probably be helpful maybe rather or in addition to, and I certainly am not trying to ladle on more work here, but it would be helpful in these categories to give exemplars of what would what staff believes would fit into each. Mm -hmm. I mean, over the years, like it might be sort of a Frankenstein application or Frankenstein of like, this is a court letter that would exceed, this is an example of a court letter that yeah. would, you know, meets because um, I think that would be helpful during the process. Um, okay, thanks. That's helpful, appreciate it. I think that's a great suggestion and similar to like what the, the bar exam does with their grading, um, like there are samples of like what this looks like. So hopefully from the test driving, we'll be able to identify some, for example. So there'll be kind of a, a packet to assist the com committee members in applying the rubric and looking at some examples. So um, yeah, sim similar thinking, Chris. Um, so Will has a question. Yes, um, just want to understand by approving how locked into the rubric as it exists now will we be will we be able to make changes could we have a working group get together or after the test drive make substantive modifications before applying it next year um, and along the same lines when when would you expect to conduct the, the test drive session it's, it's a pretty tight turnaround. Um, so this this um, the commission ultimately has to approve it and they're meeting on the 15th. So um, what we're seeking is the committee recommending approval for that commission meeting um, on the 15th and before the application release. So I, I don't know in terms of like substance. So it couldn't change. change after that? Is, like is descriptions could change and like point, points could change, but like it, it, like it's in concept, but like I, to rework the whole thing by the 15th, um, Without like the committee's in input at this point, I think it might be. We're, we're it's a. I, I don't know. If we'll, we'll but we could make a, yeah. we could, we can make adjustments based on the test driving, but I think um, you know changing things significantly probably would not be possible given our time frame. Does that make sense? Right. I got. Yeah. I just want to understand what how, how locked in we are because I think this is a really excellent start. Um, you know, I like where it's going, um, but I don't know that it quite meets what I imagine for transparency and equity and clarity for all the, the grant members, I feel like there's a lot of ambiguity for me as I read through it. If I was trying to construct the grant application, I'd be like, well, what do you mean innovative? Um, and I think that can be filled out a little more, but if we don't all have the same concept of what's the innovative, what's uh, meets or exceeds right. expectations, um, right, and we'll and we'll just um, you know before the um, HP RFP process, you know we had the you know working groups and the team had kind of the same questions. You know what does innovative mean, and it kind of means something different to everybody. Um, so I think those are discussions that um, you know we can try to have as we're test driving, but also we'll also have again when we are reviewing the applications for 2022 in our calibration uh, with with um, kind of the new set of applications that we'll we'll be reviewing. You know, uh, one thing uh, I, I want to raise from my conversations with Professor Meeker, who was on my working group for the uh, um, HP uh, RFP grants and brings a lot of experience to looking at rubrics, uh, was that uh, he says that these are always helpful, but they're always, um, they get better the more you use them. So the first time you make one, you'll see a lot of things to fix the next time, and, and every time it gets better. Uh, so I, I think we're on the right track to try to make this as good as it can be. Um, but it's never going to be perfect. Uh, we're always going to want to make it better next year. And, and apparently that's to be expected. And, and actually that's um, kind of our process with uh, trying to implement a rubric for uh, this next grant cycle so that we will have information to really um, improve and revise and tinker with for the codification process. And just to be clear, it, after we score a bunch of these things for, for next cycle. Um, the, the committee and the commission still retains discretion, right? You don't just have to take the top 25. Yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. So that's helpful. Although we probably want to be able to explain why. Sure. <laughs> I guess um, it sounds like with the tight turnaround and the test drive, there's 
not a lot we can do. So I'm not sure it's going to be a useful uh, for us to spend the time to go through all of the concerns that I flagged while I read through this. And I, I understand that it, it won't be perfect and I would not expect it to be. Uh, but I think there's, there's some, you know, high level questions like on the eligibility requirements, for example, I think the ambiguity around at or near the courthouse, that, that requirement or that um, self-represented litigants, these are threshold eligibility requirements. And as it's stated, I would read them pretty restrictively. But what we actually mean is not that restrictive. We allow Legal Aid Marin to have community court, not at the courthouse or near it, but we qualify it by saying, if you can get a judge in a, and have hold court session there, then it's a, it's a court, which is great. I love that. But if we're talking about transparency and equity, then it needs to be clear to applicants that that's our definition and not that it has to be in the physical building that most of us understand to be a courthouse. The same with self-represented litigants. If we're saying, as long as you don't appear on a, uh, on a record before the court and you're not, um, that basically that was the only requirement I saw that they can actually stand there. They can speak for the judge in the community or speak to the judge on behalf of their client in the community court. Um, and they can establish uh, attorney client privilege, um, which all to me, at least as I, as I read it initially go, that's not what my imagined self-represented litigant to be. And so that's sort of ambiguity there. And then there are a couple other places where I think it could disadvantage um, applicants, especially new applicants when they read it and they're like, oh, I don't qualify. I'm not doing this or you know, I'm, my piece isn't there. It's probably a small subset. I don't know how many people would self disqualify themselves, but it's still a concern if we want this to be an improvement and achieve the goals that were stated at the beginning of the memo. Discuss, thank you. I, I think a lot of these points um, are, are longstanding concerns that um, might best be addressed, not in the scoring rubric, but in the underlying materials, um, you know, guidelines or something else so that everybody, when they open up the package at, to begin with understands what we're looking at rather than just uh, having these be uh, understood through the scoring rubric uh, by ourselves. Um, this is not the first time the questions have come up. They've been really hard to answer. Um, but I, I don't know that we're going to want to put the answer here in the rubric uh, because this isn't the place where it's going to um, reach the most people and do the most good. So I, Dan, I agree with that. And I guess, you know, one thing that occurs to me, I'm sorry if I'm jumping the queue here, but, you know, our greatest advantage in this whole process has always been, and I believe remains, having effective and open lines of communication with these two communities. By that, I mean the community of the court through judicial counsel and through Bonnie. And I think you know, that remains an important priority and it doesn't change with the application of this or development of this rubric. And the second is the legal aid service provider community through LAC and through the, you know, provision of or the communication of the of information from the commission or from the staff through LAC in order to, you know, make sure there isn't any misunderstanding or self-censorship. And so uh, I guess I, you know, ultimately believe that whether we institute this um, and it looks, you know, this way or that way, that those things remain essential and, and are really the primary sort of battle lines here in terms of transparency and participation. Chris, that's a really good point. I know last meeting, Bonnie had some really great ideas about some outreach that we would do, especially to more rural courts um, and legal services providers. So I think, um, you know, with the feedback we've gotten today, 
Um, we can do some additional outreach. I know LAC does informal outreach on our behalf on this. And so we can maybe um, uh, be more uh, uh, formal in our outreach uh, moving forward on this. And, you know, it might make sense that we hold like a really brief webinar on, you know, you, how the new rubric impacts um, grant applications for, um, for, for 2022. Um, and so, you know, uh, I think, um, you know, all, all of your comments um, are really helpful and we definitely want to be transparent. I mean, that's the point of trying to formalize um, the review process and uh, provide some written documentation of how decisions are being made. Um, and so uh, maybe it is a more formal outreach uh, webinar so that um, every, every, you know, buddy who wants to apply is on the same page and has the same information as somebody who's applied for the last, you know, 10 years. So um, I think, I think that's, something we could build in. So this is Deborah. I just wanna say having submitted a number of these partnership applications over the years, I think this is a big improvement. That's not to say that it's perfect. I agree with a lot of Will's comments. I think a test drive is a great idea too. I think a webinar is an, an excellent idea because as an applicant, you often sit there mm -hmm. wondering, what does this mean? What does yep. that mean? Um, but I also agree for the time being, we need to move forward. So maybe we can move forward and at the same time, look at these other issues. Yeah, I'm prepared to move forward as well. I, I just, but I am curious to know what the, what the plan is for the test drive process. So we have Eric who volunteered. Are there any other commission members who'd like to volunteer? So um, Elizabeth, what's the timeline here? Uh, Crystal um, has a better sense of that. Um, I'll be reaching out um, later this week, actually, with a subset. I think about, um, we'll do about like, five, I don't know, five to 10. I'll, I'll firm up with mm -hmm. Elizabeth um, of the um, approval, the grants that were approved for 2020, um, and then send them out, and then you'll apply the rubric. So there'll be some supplement of information. I think we're, we'll have you have it, um, maybe get it back by early next week, um, just so we can um, make any changes. So it, it'll be pretty, pretty tight. Um, posting deadline is, is 10 days prior to the meeting. So um, you just want to be mindful of that. No, I, I, I would love to participate in this, but I, I just can't on this short notice, given what I have to do this uh, in this month. Well, do we need to do the test drive um, before the commission meeting? Um, I mean, it would be helpful if you wanted to change any the weighting. Um, but we could also do the calibration session after, you know, test driving after um, it just, and maybe ask the commission to approve in concept with um, additional kind of minor changes after the test driving is complete. Can, can, can we do that? Because even for those folks who can participate mm -hmm. in this truncated period, I don't know that we're gonna get the most valid uh, sort of results from the test drive that that we might get more valid results or more information if we had a longer period of time yeah to do that okay so it, it, it I think we'll still need to um, do this in December because we are planning to uh, release the um, applications in January mm -hmm. um, and we want to have all the information um, available to um, applicants um, mm -hmm. the other the um, other thought uh, you know, asking the commission to, uh, you know, approve in concept um, with giving authority back to the committee to um, make adjustments based on the test drive, something like that. I think yeah. we can. Yeah, I think that sounds really excellent. And thank you, Deborah, for your comments. I, I definitely understand that it's an improvement and that it's, we want to keep moving forward on the process. I just wanted to make sure I had a clear understanding of how we could make easy, what I think are easily achieved improvements before we go ahead and implement it for this coming year. And it sounds like there's a proposal of uh, using the test drive and calibration and uh, asking the commission to grant the committee the ability to make those adjustments this December, assuming we can all get together and that's a good timeline. Um, I'm also volunteering to, to help out there just to add my name to the list, thank you. And would it just be, um permission to make adjustments to the weightings of each category? Is that what you're envis envisioning? I think so. Okay. 
I was also thinking it might might be a basis for coming up with um, illustrations of you know what might exceed expectations or meet expectations, something like that. To me, that is um, sort of the most difficult part of this evaluation because I, I don't really think we've ever looked at these applications. I know I haven't necessarily looked at them uh, from that perspective, whether whether one program sort of is exceptional versus another that meets the expectations. If the money was there, we were gonna give each program the money, regardless of how they sort of showed up on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, it would be great if we could sort of get on the same page as to, between those two categories of rating, what, is, what does that mean? Uh, so, you, for example, um, on picking up where Chris mentioned, you know, the uh, category of court involvement, you know, I think sort of intuitively, we, we, we want to make sure that when a court requests that a program be put in place, that, that we get that program funded. We, okay, that's a good, ex, a good example of something that maybe exceeds expectations. <clears throat> On the other hand, we've had, we have really good programs where the court's involvement has been minimal. They provided space for example, um, or something along those lines. So, uh, yeah, I, right now in the abstract, I'm just having a hard time seeing how mm -hmm. these are going to apply. I'd really like to go through some exercise. Of and Bonnie applying. had a question on this, on this uh, topic. Uh, asking uh, if there was uh, a sense of what the committee would consider to be innovative, for example. I'd some ideas. Yeah, about you know, when I when I made that suggestion, my my thought was something that was truly innovative that you know, either hadn't been done before, or it's a significant innovation on something that has been done. Um, I don't mean innovative in the sense that it's never been done in that particular county. That's not, to me, that's not innovative. Uh, but something, you know, kind of stands out as new. That, that's what I had in my mind. I don't know what anybody else thought, but when I made that suggestion, that based on what Chris had, had said earlier in the meeting, that, that was kind of what I thought. I, my, my take on that, Justice Murray, is that Again, this is a, it's a scale. So innovation can be something, I, I guess I would say that something new to a county it, that's been piloted elsewhere would be innovative for that county, but not necessarily innovative at the highest level. But like community court, I'm not sure where that had been done successfully and in partnership. And so to me, like, that would be an example of an innovation. Um, you know, I think over the years, we've sort of seen several innovations. And um, some of them, me, that just, you know, without sort of thinking about the breadth of those examples, um, there have been, like, for example, domestic violence um, programs that I can recall reviewing in which um, they have begun to offer ser services in new languages with outreach in specific communities. Um, they've set up uh, clinic type um, uh, locations which are at or near the courthouse but in new places with the specific intent of meeting communities where they are so things like that I think are innovative and I'm sure what Dan I, I I mean I imagine you could put together a list of you know half a dozen over the, the many years that would be 
Yeah, you know, it, but it's so tricky because I don't think it's an even playing field. Um, how do you compare a court that's gonna that's asking for its very first ever partnership project, but doesn't really know what it's doing and isn't you know maybe as engaged as some of the others versus one that's got a lot of experience and it just sort of par for the course and we're going to do another one so you know run them through the system. Um, I I don't know how to how to compare these and when you get right down to it. Um, we will be as objective as we can be, but it's going to be subjective at the bottom. We, we have to decide what we think is important and how it fits in this, in this rubric. Uh, so I, I'm really hesitant to, to come up with suggestions. People are going to use those as, as um, directions, like this is what they want us to do, and, and it may not be the right thing for their courthouse. Yeah, but Dan, I, yeah, I guess I, when, I, sorry, Justice Murray, I, I, just to say, but, I, I don't think, I didn't interpret the question as what we would suggest somebody does to innovate just what is an example of an innovation i mean for example well, for our own that, evaluative purposes yeah mm -hmm. and the flash, flash care was addressing a specific need that was an an innovation in the sense that they said hey we've got this giant backlog we're going to partner with this uh lso and we're going to basically bang through like ancient cases <laughs> You know, and that was like that was a problem in terms of backlog in San Francisco County that didn't exist in Yolo or in, you know, Alpine. So, I mean, I, I do think innovation will be specific to a specific court, but and I don't think it's going to look a certain way. I, but I, I do like the idea of rewarding people, not just running it back. Because the issue that we've confronted in this committee over the years has been, well, they tied a pink ribbon around it instead of a red one. It's the same program, you know, they gave it a new title. I mean, it's a need, like there's nothing wrong with the program to begin with, but it's like, it's not new. And so I do think like having, encouraging innovative thinking is, a, I, I, at least I am supportive of that. I, I do think it's easier to talk about that in terms of innovation than in terms of court engagement. Um, and if it would be helpful, I can look back at, uh, you know, the last seven to 10 years and, and, and see what seemed to be, um, you know, noteworthy to me. I, I, you know, honestly, I think that would be helpful because I, I just think for our own internal purposes of these evaluations, we, we sort of need to be on the same page in some of these categories, including innovation. Can I, I can I ask about uh, the, um, the the twenty point category, the funding priorities? Sure. Um, and I also just want to be mindful of time. Um, I know that we yeah this for an hour. Uh, yeah, and I I just want to ask about the treatment of five year plus rural programs. Uh, in this sort of gradation of who gets higher points. I, I, I'm not clear what the 54321 is on the right hand column. And, and uh, I'm also a bit concerned that we would be giving brand new projects, say, in a community with lots of resources, a priority over a rural project that's been in existence for a while. Um, so that's you know, how the priority resources. And, and I, you know, we've never written it down like this, where rural projects don't get the same priority. And I guess I'm a bit concerned about about that. And I, if I was in one of those rural projects, I think I'd be concerned about that as well. So Justice Murray, the 54321, that is to allow commis commissioners to have discretion in, in um, assigning points. Um, so if it's, for example, you know, an older project in a rural community that's really providing a service and filling a need, you could give it five points versus, um, you know, uh, a new project in an urban 
county that maybe has a lot of other services, you could give that one point. That That's to get, allow for discretion. Um, and then um, uh, as things are laid, as the policies are laid how out. Does it, how does that translate to the four points then? To the times four at the bottom? Mm -hmm. So you, I mean, it, that's just the weighting for it, for that category. So you could give it five points and it'd be weighted four times. So you'd get, it'd be 20 points is the total, is the max. Versus if you gave it one, only four points would be the max. Um, and the policies that are in the rubric, I just want to um, clarify that um, those are all policies that the commission approved for partnership grants. We did not change, Crystal did not change uh, any of the language of the policies. We just translated them into the rubric. Um, because as you know, um, the board is uh, who can change policies uh, for us. And so we didn't want, um, you know, while we're, uh, test driving everything. We we didn't want to um, elevate it to the board yet. We wanted to do it along with codification. Okay. So in our in our current written policies, we have we have it set forth in this sort of hierarchy. Yes, yeah. of, yes. yes, that's the way it's set forth. But of course, this committee has discretion. These are discretionary grants, and so yeah, I, I guess yeah. I've always just focused on the discretionary mm -hmm. part of it, not what's yeah. written down. Um, just for timing for, for those who are, can volunteer, um, since the, the um, turnaround time for the 15th is tight, um, I think what we would want maybe is to get the feedback and test driving done by mid-December. Just be mindful of the um, upcoming holidays and, and the, the release of the application. So it'd be two weeks instead of the one week. Um, just to um, confirm, Eric, Will, and Justice Mary, you're able to participate for this testing with the um, extension of that timing. No, I already had a bunch of things on my plate for this month. Okay. I, I didn't see this coming. Um, Crystal, I can participate. Somebody just called me yesterday Deborah? about doing an extra project. So. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. I, I think it'd be a good balance with the newer um, newer committee members as well as those who've been um, who are familiar with these. So thank you, Deborah, for volunteering. Um, I know we're a little we're behind. So I, I believe the motion that we wanted to propose was that the committee recommend approval, um, and we'll carry over that um, in concept approach to the commission at, at its December 15 uh, meeting. But again, there'll be some flexibility to to make adjustments um, to the weighting. Um, of, of the rubric once we get the test driving in place. So I'll, I'll, I'll make the motion and then I have to jump off after the vote. <laughs> I'll, I'll second. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll have a roll call vote. That sounds great. Benerelli? Yes. Um, Bartleson? Bichelli? No. Iskin? Yes. Myers? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. All right. Uh, motion passes. Um, let's see. And I believe I was the last one before adjournment, Christina. Crystal, can you, do, can you send me the materials? I, I, it may be that I have the opportunity to glance at it without. Yeah, you're welcome to send me any details. comments as well outside of the testing, and we can um, take that into consideration. Why don't you send them to everybody and anybody who is able to work on it, we will, because I think there was a lot of interest. Okay. All right. Is there anything further we need to discuss? Four minutes over time. Well, thank you, everybody. So we'll adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Where's the button? Thanks all. Thanks all. Yeah. So uh, Kim, I think we can stop recording.